Before we resume consideration of amendments, I am going to use my powers under Rule 9.8.5b to take a motion to approve an SSI at this point. And I therefore invite George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motion S6M07734 on approval of an SSI. I am happily moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. The question is that motion S6M07734 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I can also inform the Chamber that business managers have agreed to move items of business other than consideration of Stage 3 amendments to tomorrow afternoon, and a business motion to give effect to that will be taken at the conclusion of proceedings on amendments. We now move to Group 14, copying of certificates to other Registrars General, and I call Amendment 55 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary in a group on its own, the Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 55. Uh, thanks, President Officer. Uh, this amendment in my name uh, removes Section 12, which requires copies of gender recognition certificates to be given to other Registrar Generals in the UK so they can update register entries as required. So if the UK Government decides not to update English and Welsh birth certificates on the basis of a GRC issued in Scotland, there can be uh, no need for the requirement to send copies. This amendment essentially future-proofs the Bill against that possibility. Whether or not... Uh, yes. Michael Mara. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I would just like to take this opportunity to clarify a, a point raised in a briefing that was received by MSPs by, from Murray, Blackburn, Mackenzie. They say that it is unclear whether or not the bill in front of us removes access to the UK Gender Recognition Panel for people living in Scotland. So I just want some clarity if the Minister is able to provide that to the Chamber, can, uh, whether, people, whether or not people living in Scotland will continue to be able to obtain a GRC from the UK Gender Recognition panel, panel, or will that route be closed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, they will uh, until this a bill and act is in place because obviously there will be a delay until commencement and up until that point that route of course will be open to people and then the new route will be open uh, to people once this uh, legislation uh, is enacted. Um, provision for um, Sorry, this is another important point I should make. Whether or not register entries in the rest of the UK will be updated is a matter, of course, for the UK and Northern Irish governments. Provision for sharing GRCs can still be made in a Section 104 order, if agreed. And on Monday, I met with the UK Minister for Equalities, Kemi Badenoch, where we agreed to continue uh, to work constructively together on these matters. And I'm sure that will continue to be the case. And I move Amendment 55. Thank you. I call Jeremy Balfour. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, President Officer. Um, and I can thank the Cabinet Secretary for the information shared so far. Um, I am tentatively wanting to support this provision, as I notice it's in the Gender Recognition Act 2004. So presumably it is not necessary to replicate this provision in this bill. However, I would like to get some clarity if that is the reason for the removal of this provision from the face of this bill. So I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary can confirm that this, or if it is, being removed for another reason. For example, is the entire provision of copying gender recognition certificates no longer deemed necessary due to technology? And if that is the case, could the Cabinet Secretary confirm that she has spoken to each Register General across the United Kingdom to confirm that this is the case? Hope the Cabinet Secretary can provide clarity to the public and myself with these answers before we vote on this amendment. Thank Cabinet you. Secretary. Well, as I say, the, the reason for this is to future uh, proof this uh, bill against the possibility that uh, the UK government may decide uh, not to recognise uh, Scottish GRC. So it's just a, a, a practical uh, measure to take um, if that's the case. I should add, I hope that that's not the case. And I hope that the UK Government uh, will uh, decide to recognise GRCs, but we have to uh, make this uh, 
provision just in case they do not. Now, uh, provision for sharing GRCs can still be made in a Section 104 order if agreed. And I know that uh, officials uh, from the Scottish Government and the UK Government have actually been working very closely and very constructively for a num number of months around some of these issues. Um, so I hope that provides some clarity to Jeremy Bell. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 55 in the name of Shona Robison is yes, 119, no, 3. There were four abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 112 in the name of Ash Reagan, already debated with Amendment 54. Ash Reagan, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 113 in the name of Ash Reagan, already debated with Amendment 54. Ash Reagan, to move or not moved. move? The question is that Amendment 113 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a division and membership cast the votes now. The vote is closed. <coughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 113 in the name of Ash Regan is yes, 60. No 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 114 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with amendment 108. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 114 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 114 in the name of Jamie Green is yes, 98, no, 14. There were 14 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 115 in the name of, name of Jamie Green already debated with amendment 108. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 115 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 115 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 100, no 10. There were 17 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 116 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 108. Rachel Hamilton, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved? The, amend oh, the, the amendment is being moved. Um, the question is that Amendment 116 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <coughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 116 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes 37, no 76. There were 12 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 117 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 54. Pauline McNeill, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 117 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 117 in the name of Pauline McNeill is yes 59, no 67. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 118 in the name of Claire Baker, already debated with amendment 54. Claire Baker, to move or not move? Uh, moved. The question is that amendment 118 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 118 in the name of Claire Baker is yes 57, no 70. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 119 in the name of Claire Baker, already debated with Amendment 54. Claire Baker to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 119 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. I call Jamie Halker Johnston for a point of order. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, sorry, my app wouldn't refresh. I would have voted yes. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 119 in the name of Claire Baker is yes 56, no 70. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 120 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with amendment 54. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 120 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. Point of order, Jeremy Balfour. App didn't load. I would have voted yes. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 120 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 59, no, 67. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 121 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with amendment 54. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 121 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 121 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 59, no, 67. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We move to Group 15, Review of the Act. I call Amendment 56 in the name of Jackie Bailey, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Jackie Bailey to move Amendment 56 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am hopeful for success with these amendments, not least because I worked with the Government to deliver them. At Stage 2, the Equalities Committee agreed a number of amendments from MSPs of different parties. The purpose of these amendments was to review elements of the Bill and any impact which the changes to the process for applying for a Gender Recognition Certificate may have made. This included an amendment lodged by my colleague Pam Duncan Glancy, which placed a duty on ministers to initiate a review within three years of the bill coming into force. And it also covered a number of issues, including the need to review the operation of Section 22 of the 2004 Act. The Cabinet Secretary said in accepting the amendment that this could form the basis of incorporating other review items at Stage 3, including those that were agreed at Stage 2. The Scottish Government has worked with members across the Chamber to develop this set of amendments which bring together all the strands of review. Using the new Section 15B of the Bill as amended, as a base, this creates a single provision review and I am happy to move them all in my name. Amendments brought forward by other members and agreed at Stage 2 are all incorporated into this overarching provision. So Jamie Green's amendments, which placed a duty on ministers to report on the impact of this Act on the placement of transgender people in prison, are included. Claire Baker's amendment requiring a review of the operation of Section 22 is included, as is Pam Duncan Glancy's amendment, which already contained a related provision. An amendment from Maggie Chapman, which requires a review of the impact on trans people of the time periods for living in the acquired gender and the reflection period is also included. Amendments 56, 60 and 91 removes those individual provisions and replaces them with the new single provision covered by amendments 82, 83 and 84 and adds gender identity health care whilst not changing the intent of those agreed amendments. My other amendments strengthen the existing provision added by Pam Duncan Glancy and reflect the views of members across the chamber. 
Amendment 85, 86 and 87 extend the scope of the review beyond that currently required by Section 15b. The additional areas covered by these amendments were asked for specifically by Labour members and include the impact on the provision of services by Scottish public authorities, whether any other amendments to the 2004 Act are appropriate and whether any changes to the guidance required by Amendment 54 are also appropriate. Amendment 90 provides for a number of items that the report of the review must set out, including any changes that Scottish ministers consider that it would be appropriate to make to the time periods required by the Bill, both before and after an application is made, the age at which a person can apply, and the process for 16- and 17-year-old applicants. Amendment 76 varies the wording of Section 15b in relation to the timing of the review. The Bill currently requires Scottish Ministers to begin the review no later than three years after Section 2 comes into force. This would be altered to be as soon as practicable after the end of the period of three years, beginning with the date on which Section 2 comes into force. This is to ensure that three full years' worth of data is available for the review to examine and provide Scottish Ministers with a little flexibility in the case of unforeseen circumstances which could prevent the review from starting. Amendment 78 expressly sets out that in carrying out the proposed review, Scottish Ministers must have regard to any data provided to them about the effect of a person obtaining a gender recognition certificate. The amendments also include that the review will include any other steps that Ministers intend to take as a result of the review. The review may of course include further matters not explicitly covered here, but must uh, as a minimum cover these items. The existing provision in the Bill that the Registrar General is not required to publish information if it risks identifying an individual who has applied for a GRC will also still apply. Amendments 75, 77, 79, 80, 81 and 89 are largely tidying amendments which are necessary to make the section read correctly as a whole. These amendments, presiding officer, bring together a wide range of areas which must be reported on when the Bill is commenced. They are comprehensive and collectively reflect the views of members from across the Chamber as well as the views of Government. They provide reassurance that the provisions of the Bill and their effect will be monitored and reviewed Taken together, I believe they provide a sensible way forward, and I hope all of Parliament will be able to support this. Thank you, Ms Bailey. I call Pam duncan Glancy to speak to Amendment 76A and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, amendment in my name aims to ensure we consider properly the impact of the Act and that we therefore comprehensively review it over time. Amendments from my colleagues Jackie Bailey and some from the Government have just, as have just been outlined seek to ensure these reviews. My amendment ensures we do this four times, with the first review taking place within three years of the Bill commencing. Scottish Labour know how important the operation of this Bill is and that some people have concerns about it. It is therefore essential to consider what further changes could be needed to the process further down the line to ensure it works for trans people and the wider public. This amendment seeks to monitor that. In short, President Officer, this amendment is designed to ensure scrutiny so that should improvements be needed or indeed concerns raised come to pass, Parliament can address them. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Ms. Duncan Glancy. I call Russell Finlay to speak to Amendment uh, 83A and other amendments in the group. Thank you, thank you President Officer. Um, today is the shortest day of the year, but it perhaps feels like the longest, and I'll try not to make it any longer. I want to begin by explaining what I'd hoped to do in this group, which is largely about future scrutiny of this bill. Now, a UK government statutory instrument was introduced last year. This made it no longer an offence in England and Wales to disclose information about a person's GRC status for the purpose of the management of offenders. To my surprise, this SI was not emulated by the Scottish Government by way of an SSI. UK-wide consistency is important for trans people and the general public. We've already, we're already aware of the potential for confusion and other repercussions between the home nations of the UK. I think this Scottish Government inaction on this perhaps tells us something more generally about the lack of safeguarding considerations in relation to self-ID. So, President Officer, I attempted to introduce this statutory instrument another way by lodging an amendment to this bill. However, this was deemed to be not within the scope of the bill by the President Officer, 
I mention it because it relates directly to Jackie Bailey's amendment number 83, which asks for ministers to review the prohibition of disclosing someone's protected information in relation to a GRC. I agree with Jackie Bailey. This should be reviewed by the Scottish Government. However, I believe that such a review should also ask and assess whether it is appropriate to discover, disclose someone's GRC status for the purpose of managing offenders, just as the UK Government statutory instrument already does. For completeness, it is worth recording that this amendment is li linked to my amendments 30 and 31 from Group 8. However, for members' information, number 83A could be passed separately to them. Now, I now turn to my final amendment. Thank goodness. Now, separate to this bill, I believe that Scottish ministers should consider bringing forward the SSI. And Amendment 134 relates to this. It is fairly straightforward in that it would oblige ministers to provide an explanation of the reasons that they might choose not to. Uh, I will also now briefly address some of the other amendments in this group, which Jackie Bailey has described as being <coughs> comprehensive and collective. I will support both Amendments 83 and Amendment 91, since they generally seek to achieve the same thing. Jackie Bailey's Amendment 56 is a consequential amendment to 84. It requires any review of the bill to include the impact of this legislation on the placement of trans people in prisons. I will support this amendment so we can properly establish the impact of the bill on women's safety in prisons. Amendment 84A is a technical subsequential amendment to 84, which I will also support. Amendment 75, 77, 79, 80, 81, 89 are also technical, and I will be supporting. 60 removes section 14B from the bill removing the review of time periods set out in this section. I understand various amendments from Labour MSPs are effectively replacing this provision, so I am happy to support it. Amendment 60, also from Jackie Bailey, is a substantive amendment that alters the initial review period of the Act, originally set out in sections 15b and 76a in Pam Duncan Glancy's name, further alters this review period. I am pleased to support Amendment 78. It requires ministers to consider relevant data about the effect of a person obtaining a GRC when carrying out a review of this bill. This should be common sense for the government. Amendment 82 requires ministers to report on the impact of this bill on transgender people, specifically those below the age of 18. I do not support under the age of 18 being able to apply for a GRC. I will therefore support this amendment, since at least it will measure, analyse and report on the consequences of this bill on those under the age of 18 who do seek a GRC. Uh, Amendment 85 will require any review of the bill to include the impact it has had on the provision of services by public authorities. I will support that amendment and also amendments 86 and 87, which require a review of the bill to consider any further amendments necessary to the Gender Recognition Act 2004. Home straight. Amendment 90 requires a review to consider changes that can be made to this piece of legislation, and 90A determines the length of the review period. I will be supporting both. Amendment 88, in the name of Ruth Maguire, would require the impact of this bill on Disclosure Scotland to be considered. My own earlier amendments sought to include a disclosure check in applicants, which would be administered by Disclosure Scotland. They were unsuccessful, but nonetheless, I will support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now call Polly McNeill to speak to Amendment 84A and other amendments in the group. Ms McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Really, it is just a very small amendment um, to include in the list of um, data to be collected to include those with a GRC and those without for completeness. Um, that is really what I wanted to say to the amendment. That was really just to add to the substantive the substantive list in the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McNeill. I now call Ruth McGuire to speak to Amendment 88 and other amendments in the group. Ms McGuire. Um, Presiding officer, I will not be pressing Amendment 88. Thank you, Ms McGuire. I now call Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I commend Polly McNeill for her remarkably short contribution in that group? Um, I'd like to chat just briefly to two amendments, uh, 84 and 90. Um, 84 
uh, is uh, a replication of an amendment that I submitted at stage two. Very welcome one. It's good to see it make a return. Um, however, um, it does seem to include uh, an additional clause at the bottom of Amendment 84, uh, for the benefit of members, uh, that any impact amendments made to the 2004 Act by this Act have had on the provision of gender identity health care by health boards and special health boards. It wasn't quite explained uh, why that uh, was added. However, I would note it is a welcome amendment given that Group 17, which we'll come on to hopefully shortly, will also discuss a similar issue. So at least that is on the face of the bill. The second amendment I wanted to look at was Amendment 90. Uh, clearly, there's been a, a lot of division over pretty much every amendment that we've had to discuss to, uh, over the last few days. But I would hope there is some consensus amongst members around Amendment 90, which I think is a welcome addition, because what it says is that as a result of the review, should that amendment pass, uh, make clear that ministers must set out any changes that it considers appropriate to meet three very specific things. The period of living in the acquired gender, uh, in minimum periods, the age at which a person can apply for uh, GRC and the process for 16 and 17 year olds. And those three issues have, by and large, been uh, issues of, of, of debate and division. Um, what I, I'm not clear, though, and this is maybe where I'll ask the Cabinet Secretary to respond, is as a result of Amendment 90, um, this, not just setting out any changes that are proposed by ministers or the government of the day, it is unclear what then happens thereafter. So, for example, what happens next if such changes are quite substantial? Uh, in any direction to the major provisions that underpin the legislation. Would that be uh, presented to Parliament via a primary legislation or a reset of the bill? Would it be through secondary legislation subject to the affirmative procedure or would it go through the appropriate committee of the day? And I don't think it quite specifies that. If it does specify it later in the bill, I'd be grateful if ministers pointed me in that direction. And the only reason I mention it is because I do think it is important that if after this review period, which is not that far away, possibly in the next parliament, uh, if, it, if it transpires, um, that members of that parliament are able to scrutinise any proposals and changes that would largely replicate the debate we've just had this week uh, and, and could reopen that. And, and I think those decisions must be uh, um, held to account and rightly debated uh, by members of, of, of any parliament. So I would ask the, member, uh, the minister to perhaps uh, reflect and comment on that in closing. Uh, remarks. But otherwise, it's good to see these coalesce in a single reporting requirement, which I will support. Thank you, Mr Green. I call Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> I want to begin by thanking all of those involved in the discussions that led to the amendments in Jackie Bailey's name. As we've heard at Stage 2, committee deliberations covered many different issues on which different members wanted reviews. My own amendment that was accepted at stage two to review the impact on trans people of the living in the acquired gender and reflection time periods and report on what changes to these might be appropriate given that review is captured by amendments 82 and 90. This bill deals with a process that affects trans people and so I, I believe it is right that its impact on them is at the forefront of the review process. I am grateful to all of those who work together to ensure that the, the, these amendments are presented in a coherent and consistent way and present, as Jamie Green has just identified, a clear review process. I think this shows some of the best of the consensus and compromise working that we have undertaken across the Chamber as part of the post-committee process. Were it up to me, I would not have included some of the reviews that are now a part of this process, but I agree that this is actually the best way forward, and I thank all of those for working, for working on these amendments that we have in Jackie Bailey's name. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I call the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. I agree with members that it will be important to review the impact of this Act, as with all legislation, um, as I undertook to do so at Stage 2. I have worked with members to coalesce a number of areas raised at stage two into a single review requirement and was pleased to be able to work with uh, Jackie Bailey uh, to bring these forward. These amendments reflect a number of helpful conversations with members across the chamber where there were suggestions for additional areas to review and report, including from Maggie Chapman, as well as amendments agreed at stage two, including uh, Claire Baker and Jamie Green. Um, and to expand on the provision lodged by Pam Duncan-Glancy. 
Amendments 76A and 90A in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy would require the Scottish Government to review the impact of the Act after three years, eight years, 13 years and 18 years. And we think this is a disproportionate uh, review requirement for a bill that is uh, about uh, an estimated 250 to 300 trans people per year being able to apply for a gender recognition certificate. As with all legislation, Yes. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, President Officer. The, the review period that I've suggested is that the bill is reviewed four times. The reason it goes on for that length of time is to allow the proper collection of data and understanding of the impact of the Act. And I don't think that is um, particularly well characterised in the way that the, 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 the Cabinet Secretary has just set out. And I hope they should agree with me that review over a period of time so that we can get proper longitudinal analysis of the positive, presumably, impacts that this will have on trans people. And I concur with my colleague Maggie Chapman in that regard, but also of other impacts that may or may not transpire. Well, of course, there will need to be further reviews after the three years, but you know, to, to say um, that they have to be so spe specified in terms of every five years, uh, we don't think is proportionate. Um, as with all legislation, the operation of the Act will be kept under review and can be updated as needed by the Parliament, but uh, as I say, this amendment I think is uh, disproportionate and I'm not able uh, to support it. I also can't uh, support amendments 83A and 134 in the name of Russell Finlay as they completely duplicate what has already been provided for in the bill and we will review whether further exceptions are required under section 22 of the 2004 Act and uh, we will set out uh, that in due course. Um, I cannot support amendment 84A in the name of Polly McNeill because this is already covered by the amendments in the name of Jackie Bailey, which contain provision to review the impact of the Act uh, on the accommodation of trans prisoners, including both those with and without a GRC. This was introduced by amendments brought forward by Jamie Green and agreed at stage two and incorporated into this one overarching review and report section of the bill. Uh, I do not support the amendment in the name of Ruth Maguire, which would uh, require us to review the impact of the bill on Disclosure Scotland, but I heard Ruth Maguire say she did not intend to, to move uh, that amendment anyway. Uh, in terms of the question uh, that was asked by Jamie uh, Green around um, if any changes are required after the review, how, how would those be done, I think was his question. I think it depends what those changes are. So, for example, making exceptions under Section 22 could be done by regulations. There are some other things that could be done by regulations, but fundamentals like the requirements for issuing a GRC would require primary legislation. So it is various, depending, I think, on the, the seriousness and, and of, of the change that is required. Um, and I, I suspect that Parliament would want us to come back to Parliament with uh, any substantial changes of that nature. Uh, so um, I think I will just leave that there, President Officer. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Jackie Bailey to wind up and to press a withdraw Amendment 56. I will be brief, Presiding Officer. I think there has been a considerable degree of consensus around the Chamber with these amendments as members acknowledge the importance of keeping this legislation under review. This is intended to both address the concerns expressed to all of us and to ensure that the legislation works effectively for those applying for a gender recognition certificate. I am grateful to the Scottish Government for their support and I move Amendment 56. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Bailey. The question is that Amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not all agreed. Uh, therefore, there will be a division and members should cast their vote now.
The vote is now closed. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 56 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 121. There were three abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. We now move to group 16 on operation and impact of the Act. I call amendment 122 in the name of John Mason. Group with amendments as shown in the groupings. John Mason to move amendment 122 and speak to all amendments in the group. Mr Mason. Uh, thank you very much. I confess I would rather have been at the carol service this evening, uh, but uh, here we go. I'd like to speak to Amendment 122 concerning prisons, and we'll mention some of the other amendments in the group. Uh, I think one of my colleagues will speak more about Amendment 71 and the issues around human rights. Now, of course, the, over the course of the discussions around this bill, prisons have featured prominently, and especially the question of who should be in which prison. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has already said this evening that uh, guidance is being reviewed uh, and that is welcome. Having asked a number of questions in the past, my understanding is that each case is currently decided on its own merits. Therefore, someone born as a man but identifying as a woman could be placed in the women's prison if they are reckoned not to be a threat to women and also if they were reckoned to be at risk by being in a men's prison. It's important that the risk to other inmates and the risk to the prison person themselves are both taken into account. This is a reasonable approach as far as I'm concerned, and this amendment seeks to confirm what is, I understand, the current position. By contrast, in a country like the United States, I understand an inmate can demand to be placed in a woman's prison, even if they might be considered a threat to women, and I think it would be a mistake to go down that route. I would also support Pam Gosell's Amendment 57. If we are going to be truly inclusive, we need to be sensitive to both ethnic minorities and to religious groups. We should not be saying that modern, secular, Western culture is somehow better than other cultures, or for that matter, than previous cultures in this country. So a review and a report make absolute sense to me. On Brian Whittle's support-related amendments, I would be broadly in support. There are already problems around the world on this topic of sport, and at the very least, we need to keep a watchful eye on how things develop. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mason. I call Pam Gozo to speak to Amendment 57 and other... Point of order, Douglas Lumsden. I would just like to... Has there been a new um, business motion being agreed for the timetable of today's events? Because obviously there's people in the gallery expecting the bill to either pass or fail tonight, and there's been no guidance, as far as I can tell, that whether that will be taking place. I thank you. I thank Mr Lums for his point of order. Um, in fact, the presiding officer, when most recently in the chair, did indicate that um, the, the business, uh, aside from the stage three amendments, would be taken tomorrow and that a business motion subsequent to a discussion at the Bureau this evening would be put before the Parliament at the end of the stage three amendments this evening. I'm not sure maybe Mr Lumsden missed that. But I would now call Pam Gozo. Point of order, Oliver Mundell. Apologies, Presiding Officer. I I'm, I'm just seek your clarification under Rule 2.2 .2, on, on what basis we continue to sit because. We passed the last business motion we passed, uh, which indicated a decision time was motion S6M073200, and it advised that decision time would be at 6.30 today. Um, clearly, the Bureau's met uh, and made a decision to change that. It's just not clear why a business motion wouldn't have been brought to the Parliament as a whole, um, and some members have already expressed a concern uh, at the change to decision time. Uh, other members have expressed concerns about the fact portfolio questions now won't get to take place. Um, and surely, if a decision has been taken by the Bureau, um, it would be reasonable and proper uh, to expect uh, such a decision to be put before the whole Parliament um, so that we can properly revise 
uh, the, the business motion. I, I thank Mr Mundell for his point of order. I, I think I just explained to Mr Lumsden for the, his, to his point of order that, in fact, as the presiding officer herself indicated uh, a while back, uh, in fact, there will be a business motion put to the Parliament at the end of the Stage 3 amendment session this evening. Uh, and, of course, the member will be aware in terms of the standing orders that the presiding officer can make consequential amendments to the business programme as the business proceeds uh, and changes in line with those uh, proceedings. And uh, that is where we are uh, just now. So I would like to call, uh, if I may, Pam Gozo to speak to Amendment 57 and other amendments in the group. Ms Gozo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My mission since I stepped foot into the Scottish Parliament is to ensure that communities, whether that be BAME communities, people with disabilities, or other marginalised communities no longer go unheard. This Parliament is supposed to be striving to be more accountable, to be more diverse and inclusive, yet has failed to listen to stakeholders who will be largely impacted by the Bill. I am disappointed to see that so many across this Chamber, aside from my colleagues and several others, have failed to listen. For many people, knowing the biological sex of a health professional carrying out a medical examination or treatment is extremely important. Under medical care, we are often at our most vulnerable. Amendment 57, in my name, seeks to address concerns that a self-declarational model may exacerbate existing problems with Section 22 of the 2004 Act. This amendment creates a requirement on Scottish ministers to prepare a publish and publish a report on the impact of this Act on patients where knowledge of the biological sex of a health professional carrying out a medical examination or treatment is required, including on religious grounds. I hope now I can answer um, the member John Mason's question earlier on in Group 13 that he'd asked. Religious women and groups have expressed concerns that this legislation could interfere with the requirements of their religion. For example, for many religious women, practicality in the Islamic faith, it is a religious requirement that they shall not let another man touch or see their body. These women therefore feel more comfortable using the services of female GPs, carers and other medical professionals. I'd like to provide the Chamber and presiding officer an example, a real example. My mum is a practising Sikh. My auntie is a practising Muslim. Now, when normally they go to the doctors, my mum would ask, basically, and I am with my mother, where my sisters are, my mother and where my auntie would ask the question, when they see in front of them, it's a biological, they see a female. And I'm sorry if my terminology is not right. I am trying to put it in the most simplest form, how people like my mother and my auntie would feel. So when they go, they see there is a woman in front of them, a biological woman. And they're quite happy having their smear test or whatever checks they have to have, cancer checks to the breasts or anything, they're quite happy. But if normally they see a gentleman on the other side, biological male, they will normally ask for, is it possible that we can have a female to basically um, uh, do that checkup? And it's never a problem. I must say the medical NHS are fantastic. They're so accommodating that they're always there to help. Now, I want you to tell me, my mum, my older mother sitting there, how can she ask? What's she asking for? What's she doing? How is she doing it? She's going to break her religion because she can't ask and they can't tell. My Muslim auntie is going to break her religion, right? Because she can't ask, they can't tell, she's scared. Is the right word coming out? Can I say trans woman, trans man? Can I say biological man, biological woman? Can I ask? And some of you can actually laugh and snigger about this. I'm sorry. I thought this was a diverse parliament, but the presiding officer, I really did. 
I have mentioned this presiding officer in the committee as well. I really try and bring the practicality out of this. This is not political. This is about religious beliefs. And we need to listen to those people or we need to provide them with the right guidance, the right law to make sure that nobody is out there discriminating, nobody is out there breaking anybody's religion. Mm -hmm. So we must ensure that this bill does not infringe, infringe upon the right to freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. yeah. According to international human rights law, the obligation to fulfil human rights means that states must take positive action to facilitate the enjoyment of basic human rights. But here with me today, I have letters from both the Muslim Council of Scotland and the Scottish Association of Mosques. These letters, presiding officer, are not based solely around the freedom of religion that this bill calls into question, but they are about concerns for women for children and for vulnerable individuals. Let me remind this chamber, these religious organisations are not alone. Other religious organisations, they were frightened to come to the committee to voice their concerns. Yeah. And we heard this from a private session. Yeah. So it's not something that I am saying hearsay. It has basically been voiced in a private session. Presiding officer, I am not going to ignore these voices like others have in this chamber. Ruth McGuire. Um, I appreciate what Pam Gosler is saying and I'm listening to her carefully. I wonder if she would agree with me that even if not every person of faith needs that single sex care, that we have to listen to those that do. Pam Gosler. Presiding officer, I thank the member for saying that question because she must be psychic that I am going to go into this next. Absolutely, we need to look at it. It's not just religious beliefs, but it's the amount of care we provide for different people, diverse people. And early on, um, my colleague Jeremy Balfour did highlight this about that care. So I want to go on a little bit onto this, onto my next bit of the speech, my amendment. I have been contacted by so many people who are concerned about what this means for vulnerable individuals, such as those with disabilities, those with a carer, and those in care homes. A particular letter that stuck with me, which is something that I did raise in a previous session too, was when a constituent wrote to me to ask what this bill would mean for an elderly woman in a care home and whether she could be guaranteed a female carer to wash and dress her. As it stands, I cannot answer in confidence how this bill will affect this elderly woman. Ultimately, by removing all safeguards to the process, this bill opens up the GRC process to a group of unknown size and characteristics. And with the existing privacy protection in section 22, many service providers will simply not be at the liberty to confirm to a patient whether the individual treating her is biologically female. Therefore, I ask the Scottish Government to fulfil their obligation to take positive action to facilitate the enjoyment of basic human rights. In the absence of amendments to the privacy protections, which were included in my amendments at stage two, but no surprise again, voted down, the least the Scottish Government can commit to do is to monitor the impact rights by monitoring the impact of this Act on patients with the knowledge of the biological sex of a health professional carrying out a medical examination or a treatment is required, including on religious grounds and setting out any steps they consider necessary in response to any concerns expressed as a result of the review. My colleague Jeremy Balfour has also proposed amendments 13 and 14 which ensures that this legislation does not negatively impact the freedom of thought, conscience and religion. 
As stated in Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which I support, similarly, I support Amendment 71 by Ash Reagan, which aims to have the same effect. I support Amendment 122 by John Mason, which ensures that this Act does not change how prisons currently operate. I also support my colleague Brian Whittle's amendments 58, 59, 67, 68 on the impact this Act on sports as biological males poses a biological adva advantage over biological women and increasing the number of GRCs could lead to more trans individuals participating in support, sports. Finally, I support Amendment 131 by Tess White, which calls on ministers to have to consult with women and girls on how the impact of the Act on women and girls should be reported. I would urge all members to back my amendment 57 in my name. Thank you, Ms Gozo. I now call Brian Whittle to speak to Amendment 58 and other amendments in the group. Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, and uh, it's a pleasure to follow Pam Goso, and I would urge the Chamber to support her amendments. I do appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, to my amendments in this bill, and can I say from the outset, which I don't think I should have to, but I'm going to, that I, along with every MSP I know in this Parliament, is in full agreement that every person should be treated equally, irrespective of colour, creed, religion, sex or gender. We all should recognise the specific challenges that the trans community have had to face and we should all want to create laws that protect them and their human rights, the same as every other person. However, as I have said before, you cannot create equality for one section of society by creating inequality in another. My amendments 58, 59 and 67 speak to the impact of the Bill on Sport as the Bill is currently drafted, which will be significant and that the need for the Scottish Government to publish guidance and collect data on the impact of the Bill, as others have, in this debate have asked for in their uh, situations. Now, the Committee deemed sport important enough to include in its investigation, but apparently did not deem it important enough to take evidence from any sportswoman, despite the Committee being offered that option. Instead, decided that trans activists and men would suffice. It speaks to a global issue, Deputy Presiding Officer, where women participants are being warned not to speak out when confronted by the prospect of competing against biological males, silencing those most affected. Some have been threatened with expulsion from the sports teams, and others have even been threatened with expulsion from college or university. However, it surely must be right that all are heard and those with genuine concerns are not automatically castigated and branded bigoted or transphobic. These amendments put a responsibility on the Scottish Government to report on the impact on sport of the Act. These amendments would require the Scottish Government or the Registrar-General to publish information, guidance or reports on the operation or impact of the provisions of the Gender Recognition Reform Act Scotland when implemented. Now, I'm not. Sorry? Somebody else? I'll take the intervention from Shirley Ann Somerville. Sorry, who's the member taking the intervention? It's uh, Shirley Ann oh, Somerville. Oh, Shirley Ann, thank you, pardon. Uh, could we have Shirley Ann Somerville, please? For an intervention on Mr. Whittle. Uh, hello? Ms. Somerville, can you hear us? Is she actually trying to intervene, or is it one of the kids? I think if we may, we could maybe continue with Mr Whittle for the moment and we can double check whether Ms Somerville is actually seeking to make an intervention. Thank you. Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy uh, Presenting Officer. I will give way to my colleague. Brian Whittle introduced the Stephen idea... Stephen Kerr. Sorry. Brian Whittle introduced the idea that certain athletes were being challenged um, in terms of uh, their preference as to whom they would compete against on the basis of the threat that they would be removed from universities or colleges. I think, in the interest of clarity, uh, I'd like to know if this happened in Scotland or somewhere else. Because that is Mr. Kerr, could you please concern. speak to the front so the yes. microphone can pick up? Thanks. Yes, I understand that. Um, the compulsion to want to look at the person one is speaking to is quite strong. I understand that. Thank you for the education. I understand that. I understand that. So that is my... <laughs> So, yes, 
I know I'm grateful to the Chief Tutor. And... Mr Kirk, could we please get the intervention completed? On yeah, I, my intervention is completed, but uh, I've got Excellent. so many people willing to help me. Excellent. Mr Whitto. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I thank my colleague for his intervention? The, the fact is, this is happening across the whole of the United Kingdom and globally. Um, it, uh, it, 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 really started, it first came to my attention in the, the USA and in Australia. It's now, it happened down south and it's now happened in Scotland. This is happening globally. Now, what I'm asking for here is, is uh, data. Be, uh, I'm not asking for any data to be collected that isn't routinely collected by many sports already. Members and competitors are categorised by sex, age, and disability. And by sex, many now many sports now give the option male, female, and non-binary. This kind of data is necessary to ensure that sport off, uh, offer takes its membership into account when delivering fairness for competitors. Now, I'm going to quote the Equality and Human Rights Commission submission here, and I think this will be an interest to the Cabinet Secretary uh, at this submission, because what I'm about to quote contradicts quite a lot of the position that the Cabinet Secretary took uh, when uh, taking other amendments uh, uh, around guidance uh, and reporting with the Scottish Government, many <coughs> amendments such as Jackie Bailey's, Claire Baker was the Apollo McNeil, uh, uh, Rachel Hamilton and Sue Webber. So the Equality and Human Rights Commission in their submission said this. We have highlighted several areas where the effect of the Bill's provision on the operation of the protections from sex discrimination in the Equality Act is unclear and have urged further consideration before legislative change is made. Additional requirements to publish information and guidance and to publish reports on the impact of the legislation, for example, on the provision of single-sex services on trans people, on religious groups and in sport could usefully assist in ensuring the effective implementation of the Act and in monitoring its impact in practice. We recommend that such amendments should be considered. I would be really interested to hear the Cabinet Secretary's response to that. The Equality and the Human Rights Commission go on to say that these amendments seek to insert specific provisions in the Act dealing with the implications for single-sex services and the definition of and, and data collection on the protected cat categoristic, uh, characteristic of sex in the Equality Act. By broadening the group of trans people who will be able to obtain legal gender recognition, the proposals have significant implications for the operation of the Equality Act in Scotland. Whilst the Equality Act makes provision to treat people with the protected characteristic of gender uh, reassignment differently from others sharing the same legal sex in certain circumstances and where justified, for example, in relation to occupational requirements, separate and single-sex services, sport and communal accommodation, such provision does not apply in every context contemplated by the Act. Now, there is a reason we must support these, amend these amendments. And I have stated many times in this place that sports should be available and participation encouraged for all, irrespective of background and personal circumstances, which, of course, includes trans athletes. But sport globally is in turmoil trying to deal with the trans community's participation in sport. It varies from sport to sport, country to country, even in the United States, state to state. It actually means that some trans athletes participate as women locally, but must compete as a man nationally or internationally. And there is precedence here for the trouble that sport gets itself into when trying to approach issues like this. Intersex athletes have been in the news a lot in recent years, as high-profile runners like Castro Semenya and Duty Chand come under scrutiny for having some physical features commonly associated with men. World athletics say that intersex women like Semenya, who have XY male chromosomes instead of XX female ones, account for just over seven in every thousand elite female athletes. Or to put that in context, 140 times more than in the general population, with a still higher podium presence. Now, Castro Semenya won the women's Olympic 800 metres and dominated the event for several years. She's an absolutely wonderful athlete. Burundi's Francine Nyan Saba won the 800m silver medal, and Kenyan eh, Margaret Wunmabe eh, won the bronze medal. Now, initially, they were banned from competing. 
And then they were told to compete, they must take testosterone suppressing drugs to compete in certain events, which made Semenya sick. All have subsequently been banned from competing in events from 400 metres to the mile. Semenya is currently in a legal battle with World Athletics to be allowed to compete in her preferred events. Now, by coincidence, I got a call this morning from uh, Frank Dick, who was the Director of Coaching at UK Athletics and now one of the most uh, celebrated coaches in the world, working across many sports. And as it happens, he was the Director of Coaching for the South African Olympic team for the 2016, uh, 2016 Olympics and worked with Semenya's coach. He told me not, on, not only was Semenya destroyed by the sport's inability to deal with her issues, her family and the community from which she came from were destroyed. To of course, I'll, I'll get to you. Jamie Green. Uh, I, I'm extremely grateful for the member's contribution in illustrating uh, uh, some real-life examples. I would ask, um, given his experience and knowledge of the subject that he's eloquently speaking to, um, notwithstanding the wording of his amendment, which talks about reporting requirements and presenting numbers to Parliament, does he have any ideas on what the solution to this conundrum might be? Because it sounds like, A, it's very complex. And, I, and I'm sure lots of members, whatever their views, will have a lot of empathy with these organisations in approaching what these are quite sensitive and difficult subjects. And is, is there a solution to this? Brian Hussle. Again, he's obviously read my mind because we're coming on to that, uh, 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 Mr Green. So what I would say in conclusion to that bit is, is rather than protect intersex athletes, sport has a clumsy approach, has caused them harm. Much as I believe the same thing will happen and is happening, is currently happening to trans athletes. To Mr uh, Green's uh, question, Kenyan Olympic bronze medalist uh, Margaret Wambui competed alongside Semenya in 2016 in the 800 metres event. She too was barred from competing in her preferred race due to her elevated testosterone levels. Wambui, who also refuses to take medication to reduce her testosterone levels, suggested World Athletics introduce a third category to international sports competitions to include intersex people. And here's a quote from her. She said, it would be good if a third category for athletes with high testosterone was introduced because it is wrong to stop people from using their talents. And who could disagree with that? These are wonderful athletes uh, that, that need the, the opportunity to participate. And I think what she says there, I, I concur with. And they have tried this. In the New York Marathon, they introduced a non-binary category. This year, the entries to this category increased by 300%, which tells me that those in that category are now feeling validated and more confident about having a place in sport, which is exactly, surely, what we want. However, there's still a significant issue to settle in that the trans woman who won this category and collected the $10,000 prize money finished outside the top 1,000 overall finishers. Now, tell me that's not a situation that's not open for exploitation by the unscrupulous. Checks and balances still are still needed, and there is a long way to go. You see, presenting officer, sports national governing bodies are unsure of the legalities in which they can act and that they may leave themselves open for court action on the grounds of prejudice, or conversely, if a trans athlete is injured or injures a fellow competitor, then the sport may be left open to legal action for failing to take appropriate action to protect the safety of participants. In other words, many sports are not taking any action for fear of making the wrong decision. Clear guidance is required from the Scottish Government. It cannot be subjective. I was asked by a national governing body if they took action to prevent a trans athlete from competing on grounds of safety or on grounds that the trans athlete had a material advantage from the sex in which they went through puberty, would they be acting illegally? It is not just national governing bodies, Deputy Presiding Officer, who have to make the decision on sport. Teachers, coaches have exactly the same issue when selecting teams. I am one of those coaches. And I'm qualified uh, as a, a senior four, uh, level four uh, uh, coach. I'm a former chair of the Scottish Athletics Coaches, and I'm a member of the European Coaches Association. And I don't know. And the fallout from the wrong decision is significant here. In the case of a male and female athlete of the same size, the male athlete can generate approximately 160% 
of the force a female can. A person born male transitioning to female retains many of the male characteristics which give a huge unfair advantage. Now, I never ever thought, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would ever have to talk about the Q angle at the hip. That is the, the, the angle between the hip and the knee. And, and when a woman goes through puberty, that angle changes into, a, a, into a, 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 a position where they can give birth. And that really impairs their ability to apply force. Male athletes have a bone density of about 30, 33 per cent more. They have muscle mass of about a third more. They have a greater uh, lung capacity and, a, and a, a bigger heart. Women have to go through, have to deal with menstruation when, when uh, competing in sport, I was, as was highlighted by Dina Asher Smith and Elise McColgan uh, in the summer there. And also, of course, men, women have to go through menopause. In the case of trans men competing in women's sport, if they are transitioning, they are likely to be going through hormone replacement therapies, hormones which are illegal according to the World Anti-Doping Association because they give women an unfair advantage in terms of muscle growth and exercise recovery. In other words, it is tantamount to legalised doping. It is generally only at elite level that anti-doping is present, which leaves every other level of competition open to a significant inequality. Now, I want to give an example of the difference between male and female sport. And I'm going to go all the way back to 1985, where the German De Democratic Republic athlete Marita Koch broke the world record for 400 metres. German Democratic Republic, of course, we had, had a state-sponsored doping programme. She ran a time of 47.60, and since 1985, not one single woman has got anywhere near that, that mark. But what if I tell you that last year that mark was beaten 10,000 times by men? I want to talk about Caitlin Jenner. I've, I've, I've spoken to her before. She, she brought the, the, the issue of the, of the trans community to the fore. She has done incredible work in that, in that, uh, in that area. But in 1976, Caitlin Jenner won the male uh, decathlon Olympic title. She states that trans women should not be able to compete in women's sport, and she should know. Surely we cannot have women excluded from sport as they are currently being because politicians can't openly discuss concerns and develop decent law that is fit for purpose. And I don't think this, don't think this is just happening at elite level. It is across all age groups and abilities in our schools and in our sports in this country. And let's not forget the potential impact on the insurance of sports and teachers and coaches. With an increased risk comes an increased cost. The Chamber may not want to recognise risk, but you can be sure that the insurance companies will. When change is being considered, it is an absolute requirement that consequence is anticipated. At stage two, the Cabinet Secretary told me that she cannot be expected to decide which sports are affected. But, Presiding Officer, the Cabinet Secretary does not need to because sport has done that already for you. It is why sport has a women's category to ensure fairness and safety. There are over one million women and girls participating in sport in Scotland, and it has been a long fight to try and get equality between men's and women's sport. We have come such a long way in my lifetime. In setting this bill, it is imperative that the government considers the impact of the bill across all of society does not pass the buck and negate its responsibilities for the changes it proposes. We must protect women's rights and sports, as well as ensuring trans rights are protected the same as for every person. Uh, point of order from Julian Mackay. Thanks, Presiding Officer. There's been an accident at the back of the chamber. I wonder if we could suspend for a minute. Just oh, so absolutely. We'll suspend. Thank yes, you. Thank you.